the paramedics. So I'm going to be talking about bringing machete to the Amazon. And what that means is, uh, well, we're going to figure out what that means as I go through the slides. Um, but um, give a hint, it probably has something to do with AWS. So quick show of hands, how many people have spent a little time with AWS? Everybody? A few folks? All right, awesome. All right. As I'm up here, uh, you know, waving my hands around, if, so, if somebody is, is just suddenly st struck to ask a question, feel free, um, or you can save the questions to the end. Um, I, I've done a lot of talks at B-sides where people just kind of interrupt you while you're going, and that's cool. Um, if I think it's a bad question, I'll just keep talking. So, you know. All right, so, uh, so this is the validation that you are uh, uh, talking and the right guy is presenting. Um, if I shaved this morning, it would have been bad. Uh, as I was told. So I'm, uh, I'm an AppSec guy. I've been doing this for about 17 years now. I'm a director of technology strategy at a company called Veracode. Uh, we're focused on software security. And um, I've been researching and spending a lot of time with AWS and, and, and other cloud providers probably since about 2009. And uh, it's been a really interesting Wild West kind of ride. Uh, things have been moving amazingly fast. And um, if you, uh, you know, got started using AWS, you probably made a lot of mistakes in the beginning, learned a lot of lessons the hard way. Um, you know, the, the community kind of grew around this whole thing, and um, I'm going to be talking about a bunch of the, the, the things that we've discovered from a security perspective uh, when working with AWS. This is a brief kind of goal for me to, like, stay on target here of what I'm going to try to talk about today. Um, a little bit of intro, a little bit of what, you know, the broader picture, and then we'll dive deep into a couple areas that I wanted to focus on, all right? And that's the, uh, the machete part of the, uh, the presentation right there as well. So some big picture kind of things to think about. I want everybody to take a step uh, you know, back or take a step with me for a second and um, not think of cloud as uh, you know, a place where I put a bunch of systems or servers or whatever. To me, cloud is an operating system, right? And the reason I say that is because I want us to kind of use this as a framework as we go through this presentation to think about it like this, right? So what is an operating system? It gives me storage, it gives me disk, or Memory, it gives me computing power, and I have an API that I can use to call and, and start up all those things, right? What is AWS or Google or, any, or uh, you know, Azure or whatever, what does that give me? It gives me exactly the same thing, right? So think of cloud as, an oper as, as the operating system itself for a future set of applications. And things like Linux and Windows, that's the microkernel in this operating system, right? So with that framework in mind, What's the code that runs in this operating system? Well, it's the infrastructure, right? So the infrastructure is my code. And we've probably heard that term before. But those two pieces are exactly how I think we should perceive cloud and change our way of thinking about it from both a you know, security perspective, a, a management, and, and, and uh, you know, how we might think about uh, interacting with it, not as a place where I have a bunch of virtualized systems, right? So, since a lot of people already kind of told me they've been working through AWS, I won't spend much time here, but that's a typical AWS application, a nice clean one that I can fit into a nice clean Visio diagram. And, you know, it can look like something like this. I've got a lot of things going on. I've got some computing cluster going on. I've got a MapReduce cluster over here. I've got DynamoDB for backend database storage. All these various services, a lot of services that I might be using if I'm using AWS, right? If I've built a fully realized application, for AWS, not just forklifted something, I might be using any number of these services or maybe a whole bunch of other things, right? Now, from an AppSec perspective, traditionally, where everybody, uh, you know, in, in the AppSec world has been focused on is the code that we're writing or the third-party code that we're incorporating in our applications. And in an AWS world, that part of my application is actually a relatively small percentage of that overall piece, right? I have code that fired up all this infrastructure but the piece that I wrote, the part, and you could argue it's probably the most important part because it's kind of that beating heart, but the part I wrote represents a small percentage of that, and it interacts with all of these pieces, right? And it might interact with these pieces in ways that I can't expect. So the challenge is that all of this is provided to me, and I deploy my application into it, and Amazon gives, gives that to me, but using it securely, using it responsibly is entirely on my shoulders. All right, and I have to think about, uh, when I think about deploying an application or, or, or building an application for this operating system, I need to think about the entire system. All right? So what do you get from AWS? Well, this is like that scene in uh, The Matrix where Neo walks out and he says, I need guns, lots of guns, right? Instead he says, I need servers, lots of servers, and like racks just start showing up, right? That's exactly what you get from AWS, right? You get a, 
infinite uh, you know, empty rack space, basically. A friendly looking web interface, which can get you into all kinds of trouble. And a mile long list of compliance certifications, right? And then the rest is entirely up to you. Um, it's a very secure container, and then you show up. Then your developers show up. Then somebody who's never used it before shows up. And that's where you start to get in problems, where you get the virtualized equivalent of that, right? Where you end up with wires hanging out all over the place, you're stuck in there, you're, you're buried in there. And if you started new in AWS, this story might be you, right? Or you gave this to a developer who never ever uh, knew what, you know, what to do in AWS. They started clicking on things in the web interface. You, maybe you went away for a vacation for a week, you came back and you go, why do I have 39 security groups called Launch Wizard X, right? And there are all the security group rules are set to zero, 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 and it allows everything in. And like, why is all this stuff hanging out there? Why is my bill five times what I was expecting it to be? You got teams going, where did my stuff go? It just disappeared, right? And it can be a complete wild west. That, you know, if you don't basically keep an eye on this stuff or build a system to kind of monitor this, Interesting property of AWS is that it trends towards chaos. This is the jungle that we need to kind of bring a machete to, right? And if you don't have a way to kind of forge your path through that with a machete in some way, you're going to end up with a lot of mess or the virtualized equivalent of this guy sticking out of the, uh, the, the, the wiring cabinet here. Now, you might say, you know what, when I start my introduction into AWS or I start my introduction to the cloud, I'm just going to forklift my existing apps. And that's not entirely safe either, right? So first, Treating AWS like just another hosting company is a bad idea. Remember, think of the cloud as an operating system. So for starters, it's probably the most expensive way to go. But um, if you've taken all your existing controls, your existing security controls, your passwords, your SSH keys, your uh, IDS systems, whatever you have that you was sitting in your existing data center and you forklifted all that into, into AWS, it's missing a very important aspect of operating in, in, in Amazon, which is API activity and all the things that can happen behind the scenes. Uh, the other interesting thing is that low priority vulnerabilities can go from being not very interesting to suddenly very critical just by going from your on-prem data center to AWS. And that's going to be a focus of what I'm going to talk about here in a second. So think about your attack surface, right? So Chris Hoff in the mortal, mortal worlds, right? He said, if your security sucks now, you'll be pleasantly surprised at the lack of change when you move to cloud, right? And the reality is, it actually is much worse. It gets much worse, right? Um, everything that, uh, that I create in AWS is driven by some sort of API call. And those API endpoints are there conveniently for me to use. So now my ability to control this operating system and in a sense control this entire, my entire virtualized data center is entirely keyed off of my permissions and the controls that I have around my API keys. Right? And the only thing standing between a total compromise, basically your entire data center, is now that API key and the permissions that I've assigned to that. And what I think this you know, kind of pushes towards, you know, another point that I, you know, I want to kind of put, put into our minds here is that if we're deploying an environment where it's so easy to create these things, it's so easy to build the, these systems in it, and I've created an entirely new back channel for how I manage and control all those things via this, these, these API uh, endpoints, um, it creates something that, that I think of as emergent insecurity, right? So we think about emergent properties of complex systems. And AWS, with all of its services, is a very complex system. So you can certainly you know, hear the, the work that uh, the other folks are doing massive stuff in AWS. They kind of see that there's an amount of chaos that they need to, to, to kind of wrap their arms around. Um, you've got systems that, you know, like for like the Netflix folks who are building chaos into the system so that they're ready to handle that chaos, right? because they know it's going to be there, right? So the idea that you, once you take a system and it might be perfectly secure in your on-prem data center and you forklift it in AWS, these emergent properties, because of the complexity, start to emerge and the system becomes in insecure just by the interplay of all these services. And what do I mean by that? I mean, you know, some days you might have something I call internet weather, right? The internet might be running a little bit slower that day. The API calls might be running a little bit slower that day. Some days AWS is snappy, some days it's slow. Some days certain calls might fail and that might set off a chain reaction that you would never have been able to test or create an environment to test or even expect that that was gonna happen. And suddenly a system that was expecting to call some API in order to start up properly fails and the whole system maybe fails open. And if you don't have systems to be able to monitor and respond to that, that kind of pattern can, can just explode, basically. 
So what I'd like to suggest, you know, when we think about emergent insecurity is instead of trying to enforce strict change control on this, and this is a little bit scary, right? In the traditional sense, we think of AppSec and think about having a very, you know, wonderful process where everything gets tested and then it gets deployed and we have follow-up tests to certify things and all this, you know, thing. If I'm moving very, very quick, I'm moving very rapidly, and I try to enforce those things, ultimately what I'm creating is, is a brittle system that's built around artificial controls that can't handle that kind of explosive growth or explosive um, scaling up process where I've got lots of systems interplaying with each other, right? Um, I would argue that people need to think more about uh, an eventually consistent model for security where you're constantly trying to shrink your response time and uh, eventually your security and operational goals, you get to where you, where you need to be. And the better that your ability to react and respond, and I'm talking, you know, minutes, hopefully, is uh, the, the, the more secure your system's going to be versus trying to get it right from the beginning, because you're probably never going to get it right from the beginning. All right, so I've been talking a lot about the API, and the API to me is really king, right? That's the king of this jungle. Right? And if I haven't incorporated thinking about how API calls and how all that interaction goes inside of AWS, and I'm just focusing on traditional controls for AppSec, or security in general, and I'm not thinking about the big lion in the, in, hiding in the jungle, I'm going to get eaten for certain. So what do I mean by that? So here's some of the uh, vulnerabilities that are kind of, you know, so we see some classics here, some, some issues that are pretty high severity like command injection, but we see some that we might not necessarily think about that become high priority vulnerabilities, and I'll, and I'll talk about why in a second. But things like um, uh, XML entity injection or, or uh, server-side uh, request forgery, right? So I, if I have the ability to inject a request that is going to go out and request another URL, or I have the ability to inject something that's going to request something from within the, my AWS systems, those types of vulnerabilities are very, very uh, serious, uh, you know, full data center kind of compromised vulnerabilities. And I might have been spending my entire time before AWS focusing on cross-site scripting and SQL injection and nothing else, and ignoring all the rest. Hopefully you're paying attention to command injection too. But um, if, if I was only focusing on those and I didn't think about how some of these new vulnerabilities take on a new life in AWS, um, I, I, I'm probably going to get bit. And there's a couple examples of that. So why is that? So it's all about metadata. Right, this is the rock and roll part of the slide. Okay. I, just, there's a, I, I went looking for metadata, and I could not believe how many Metallica-like metadata like logos were out there. I just thought, the internet is awesome. All right, so metadata, and this is not in the NSA sense of metadata, but this is metadata that AWS or any cloud provider gives me um, to, uh, to, to figure out just where my system is and what's its role in life, right? So what is cloud metadata? It's actually uh, an RFC standard. Uh, well, it was an RFC standard that was uh, adopted for this purpose. And um, it gives you all kinds of awesome stuff. This is how bootstrapping happens. This is how I might uh, uh, distribute credentials to it. This is how I might give my uh, instance the ability to figure out what its ID is. If you've used AWS, you probably know what I'm already talking about. You've probably written a Python script or something to extract this metadata. And every cloud provider has it, right? Because it's, it's a fundamental building block of how I'm going to get information um, from, uh, from AWS while I'm running inside that microkernel, Linux or whatever to figure out. So there's nothing wrong with this, of course, right? But I just need to be aware of what information is in there, and I need to be aware that I'm, I should be protecting access to that information, right? And if my application has the ability to pull this information in, and I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about how it's pulling the information or how that information might be exposed, that can be very dangerous. So I can use something simple like wget or curl to go and grab this data if I, if I want to. AWS provides you a command line tool to pull the metadata. The interesting thing about the AWS tool is it doesn't pull all of the metadata. It actually hides some of it from you. So I prefer to use something like wget. And you can see here this, all these categories and folders are all areas of information that it's going to give. So my instance ID, um, what my uh, public IP address might be, um, AMI IDs, all kinds of great stuff that isn't relevant you know, as part of the, the bigger system that it's running. Now, what I can do with that, um, you know, if you ever wondered how um, if you're using uh, uh, you know, AWS uh, roles or permissions or you've applied a profile or a role to your instances when they come up, so that gives them credentials so that you don't have to hard code credentials into your, in your application. If you ever wondered how the, uh, the system itself gets its credentials, this is how it does it. 
So I can go and I can request from Metadata uh, IAM security credentials, and then I have to figure out what my profile ID is, and I just make a request and it tells me what it is. And then I pop that in and I make the next request. And this is what I get back. So this data here that's in red is all I need now to make an authenticated request with the permissions of that role. I can take these credentials out. I can go over to you know, my secret bat cave, put this on my laptop, drop it in. And of course, those credentials, they'll expire in a little while, but I've got full on credentials. And if I haven't been very good about how I've locked down those credentials, I now have great access into that data center right? using this information. So that key and that token, and I drop that into my configuration. If you've ever used um, the AWS command line tools, you can drop those three parameters right into your config file, and bang, now I'm making requests with these, with these credentials. Right? Or I can fire up a little Python script or whatever. So what does that mean in the real world? Well, so there's two examples here I want to talk about. Um, the first is Prezi. This, this was earlier in the year. This was in March. Um, uh, Prezi is a presentation company. They created a uh, um, uh, you know, pretty interesting kind of interactive presentation model, and they create these configuration files that you can upload. They have a, a SaaS-based service for building this out. And uh, you can go in and you can uh, uh, pop URLs into your, into your presentation. It'll go out and, and their system will fetch those URLs on the internet. They're like, oh, you have an image. Let me fetch that and put it in the presentation. Oh, you have this document. Let me fetch that and put it in the presentation. Well, the researcher uh, who, was, who was spending some time, Prezi had a bug bounty and the researcher was, was chasing it, uh, realized I could drop the metadata URL into his presentation. And he, dropped, he created a presentation with all of the metadata requests that he needed, uploaded that got his presentation back in a couple of minutes, and it was an awesome presentation. It included all of the metadata from the, the system that, the, uh, that, that was uh, doing the, the, the processing of that, uh, of, of that file. Uh, from there, he was able to get the credentials. Those credentials had more permissions than they needed to be, and from that point, he was able to compromise uh, the entire Prezi environment. And um, uh, you know, he was very responsible. He disclosed it, uh, and uh, you know, they, they were very quick to fix it. Um, and then at, uh, at Black Hat this year, Andreas, uh, he did a presentation called Pivoting in Amazon Clouds. Um, good presentation where he talked about this exact same thing, where he was able to uh, exploit a vulnerability. Uh, I think it was like a server-side request forgery vulnerability, where he was able to go in, drop that metadata API in there, pull out credentials, find that he had uh, credentials that would allow him to post to SQS, which is uh, Amazon's uh, simple uh, you know, uh, uh, queuing service post a message into that, and he realized uh, you know, he could also pull messages, so he popped a message out. He realized that the backend system was using something called uh, Celery, um, and uh, that there was a particular vulnerability in how it serialized data. So he dropped in uh, a, uh, an exploit to that and opened up a reverse shell from one of the worker nodes. And from there, he was able to pivot farther and actually extract, uh, uh, he found a, a, a key or permissions that allowed him to create users, arbitrary users within uh, within the, uh, within the uh, uh, AWS environment. At that point, it was game over. He had complete control over the, uh, the environment. Right? So very simple, low priority vulnerability that we might not care about. Like who cares if somebody can drop a URL and request something? Popping in an AWS, becoming super, super dangerous. Right? So what can we do to kind of control some of the API access? I mean, I can certainly lock down so that it only is the permissions that I need to, to have and, and, and give to that system. In the case, you know, the example I just referenced, it was a system that just needed access SQS, uh, but that was enough, right? So part of the problem is, is that I don't think about uh, API permissions in terms of the same way I'm thinking about my security groups in AWS. I'm locking down the IPs and who can get access to my data center and what networks and what servers and what systems can talk to what. It's really hard to find any documentation on this in AWS, but I can actually lock down my API calls to IP addresses as well. And I'm right now talking with the AWS team to try to figure out if we can get a little bit more specific and lock it down to specific VPCs or lock it down to specific instances or lock it down to specific accounts so that even if that API key is compromised, um, I can't do anything with it. But right now, I can go in and I can put in my source IP address from where these API calls are coming from and I can lock down all of those API calls. So if you're, not, if you're currently spending a lot of time making sure that your, profile, your, uh, your policies are locked down to just the services you need, great. If you're not doing that, rush out and do that immediately. And then think about how you can also lock it down to the IP addresses specifically that need to access those services and just add an additional layer of permissions. So even if that key does get compromised, 
it will be useless to me as an attacker because I won't be able to, to launch an attack from wherever I am, right? Um, you could also take a kind of a, you know, set the world on fire approach and just black hole <laughs> the metadata API entirely. Um, but that's a little bit dangerous. If your system is bootstrapping in any way, it's going to need access to the metadata. If the system is accessing credentials or anything like that, you're going to break all of that. So unless you've got a fully baked uh, uh, Amazon uh, machine image and uh, it has everything that it needs and it doesn't need to ever touch the metadata API, that might be a, might be a kind of a destructive uh, way to go about it. But that could be an, an approach as well to doing that. And if you want to kind of get a feel for how quickly API credentials can be exploited and used, um, <laughs> You know, there's crawlers that are constantly scanning GitHub, for example, for API keys. Amazon's running them too. They will tell you when they notice that your credentials are hanging out there. And um, you, can, uh, you can basically create a key, lock it to an IP. Um, I'll talk about CloudTrail in a second, but Cloud, how many people know what CloudTrail is? A couple folks? If you, you, everybody by the end of this talk needs to go figure out what CloudTrail is, because if you're not using CloudTrail, you don't know what API calls are happening behind the scenes. So CloudTrail tells you what's, what's going on when calls are going in. Drop a, drop a key out there, lock it down, and then go watch your CloudTrail logs. In about 60 minutes, you'll probably see somebody from some strange place you've never seen before trying to use that key to get into your system. So how does that all manifest itself into kind of you know, one particular scenario where I might have a, a bunch of things? So I'm going to drill into a couple of these things in a few other slides. But at each point in the system, I've got ways to pull information that might help me move to the next level. So I'm going to talk about private IP addresses in a second. If I'm using EC2 Classic and I haven't migrated fully to, to VPCs yet, um, the private IP address of your server is, might be relatively easy to get, thanks to a, a, a nice feature of, of uh, Amazon's DNS, where if I look up uh, or try to resolve uh, a, a, an address in Amazon, it will resolve to the private IP address so that network traffic stays within Amazon. It's great. My bill is a little bit lower. But now I know the private IP address which means I can potentially see a private side interface of that web server. So I think it was uh, CW200 or something, um, where uh, you know, in the old days we used to see private uh, you know, uh, web servers running on private IP addresses, giving up debug information, giving up admin interfaces, giving up uh, 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 information that um, is turned off for the public interface. Um, and People developing or, or deploying applications to Amazon might be thinking that their private interface is truly private, and in EC2 Classic, it's not. Um, I might take from there a vulnerability or, or whatnot and exploit a vulnerability to get the metadata. From that metadata, I can now maybe, put, uh, from, the, from the keys that I exploit, I can now potentially start extracting information based on what my permissions are. Maybe I only have permissions to clone EBS volumes. What's the danger of that, right? If I can clone an EBS volume, I don't need the password. I don't need the SSH keys. I don't need anything. If I can go and I can clone, the, clone that volume or clone whatever it is, I can take that, clone it, mount it, and now I've got a file system that I can unpack and, and crawl through it at my leisure. Right? And if I'm really smart, I can clone it into my own account so that you don't even see it on your bill. Um, the same thing's true for if I'm using RDS. I don't need your RDS password. You might have spent all this time creating a, a, a password this long so that nobody could ever guess it. But if I, can, if I have a, a API access to create a snapshot of your database, create a snapshot, clone it, bring it up, change the root password, I don't need SQL injection. In fact, I just cloned your entire database and put it into my AWS data center, and now I have complete access. And that will never show up on your database logs or your web server logs or your IDS logs or anything like that. All it'll be is a couple API calls indicating that I've snapshot your database and, and ran off with the entire system. And that's the fastest path to data exfiltration from an AWS environment than anything. Right? And then when I'm done as an attacker, um, I don't need to just destroy a couple systems or delete logs. I can nuke the entire data center. Right? Uh, it's the only way really to be sure to nuke it from orbit. Right? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go and I'm just going to destroy the entire data center. Um, how many people heard about what happened to code spaces? So code space, yeah, painful, right? They probably built the most beautiful AWS environment. I, I didn't see it, but you know, it's probably it was probably beautiful. The way they talked about it, I could only imagine it was just a, a glorious cathedral to, to AWS automation. And they talked about how they had fully fault tolerant, redundant backups and systems and everything. Problem was it was entirely in AWS, and I don't think they had any isolation between the accounts or systems that they were using. 
and I, and I really don't know firsthand, but <clears throat> somebody was able to get access, get access to the API keys. They poked around, and when they were done, they hit delete. And they killed everything. And the next day, Codespaces was out of business. Right? So you think about API access being king. This is what I mean. It allows somebody with those credentials to walk into your data center, drop off a nuclear bomb, and then walk out. And they can do that very quickly with a single API call. Um, so I was talking about clones earlier. I'll just talk a little bit more about that. Um, so remember, think about this. You know, if I can clone the EBS volume, how many times have you lost in AWS? Have you ever had this problem? This is the first time I realized this a couple years ago where I completely lost access to a system. And I was like, oh, man, how am I going to get the data off it? And I realized, oh, I just API call away, clone the EBS volume, mount it on a, on a completely different system, fix whatever I needed to fix. And in doing that, I realized, wait, I, I got access to everything, and I never had to give up my SSH key or password, or I didn't even have to have any of that information. Right? And the same thing is true of RDS. Um, the other piece that I see, uh, a problem I see happening a lot, is excessive lack of access control. Um, Developers love to do this in the network world. I'm just trying to make this work. Come on, let me just, all right, let me open up another port in the firewall. Let me open up another port in the firewall. Let me open up this. Oh, it's working now, all right, and then they forget about it. Same thing happens on the API, uh, API front. They're like, oh, I've got the key. Nobody else is ever going to get that key. What difference does it make? And they set up a policy like this. This is probably the, this is the worst policy you could ever see in your life if you see this in AWS. The second worst would be one that has just IAM star which is basically giving you this in, in two moves, right? And I see these all over the place where new environments where you've got developers who are new to using AWS have set things up. They were trying to get it working. They couldn't figure out what was going on. They went and they looked at the documentation for AWS's uh, um, uh, permissions, and it was a mile long. And they were like, you know what? I'll just turn this on and, and leave it. And this stuff hangs out there for, for a long time. And if it's particularly critical, you should probably make sure there's two-factor <laughs> turned on for for critical things like this type of th access or IAM access should never be allowed without two-factor authentication. You can lock that down in policy as well. And then the other piece is, is, is something about leakage. And I talked about IP addresses, but I'm going to talk about tags mostly here. So tags in AWS are, are, if you're not using tags, I have no idea how you're managing your stuff in AWS. But if you're, <laughs> if you're not using tags, uh, I don't know. It's not possible, right? You're memorizing instance IDs, and you're, you have an amazing memory. Um, so that's how you can keep track of everything, right? Um, but if you're using any third-party system, or you created your own system, or you're using some uh, uh, service that somebody's providing, all that tag information is flowing out the door. And I've seen people put customer information in tags. I've seen people put uh, credentials in tags. That was the scariest one. Um, uh, you know, anything. The, the, people have had this tendency to treat tags like a, a free database sometimes, where you just drop information in there. And, um, and that's a little scary. And on top of it all, you can set up permissions that are tag-based. So for example, I can create a policy that says, these users only have access to systems that are tagged uh, dev, but no access to systems that are tagged prod. But if I give somebody, now I have to think about multiple layers in my permissions. If I give somebody access to um, change tags, I'm thinking, oh, what's the big deal? I'm just going to let them change some tags. That's not a serious problem, is it? Well, your entire system might be based on tags. Your permissions might be based on tags. How your command and control environment and managing all those things might be based on tags. So that type of, of permission can be very dangerous in AWS as well. Um, so make sure your tags are, are fairly benign. They're not something you wouldn't be afraid if, if it got out into the world. Because if you're using a third-party service, they're out there. They're in those reports. And particularly if you're using a third-party service that allows you to alter tags in your environment, like remote control or, or you know just um, some management system, again, a vulnerability there could result in a compromise of your system if you've got permissions that are based on tags or, or your operation, your system itself is based on tags. And a lot of people don't think about that. And that's this kind of emergent insecurity that I'm talking about, this complexity of these relationships between these different components and systems in AWS and how they might combine together to create a, an environment where it's really hard to, to understand what's going on. Um, We'll talk much about this, but that's just basically what it looks like if I've got an example site and I go and I look it up from inside AWS, I might get a, a URL that looks like that, and then it might resolve it to a 10.IP. It's really easy. Just get off of, uh, uh, of uh, EC2 Classic and get on VPC. If you haven't done that already, uh, you really should. <clears throat> um, just a casual poke, 
looking around the, uh, the EC2 Classic address space. Very casual, not to upset anybody at AWS. Just randomly looking, OK. <laughs> um, hundreds of web servers out there um, with interfaces that are showing admin pages, back-end pages that, that they're probably using inside their networks. And they're not thinking about how, uh, how, how accessible they are. Um, and then the last big challenge is, is just lack of awareness, right? So a couple people raise their hands about knowing about CloudTrail. Um, for most people in AWS, the most advanced IDS system they're using is their bill, right? How many people are using their bill as their IDS system? Nobody wants to admit it, right? Okay. Most people go, oh, they reach the end of the month and they go look at their bill and they're like, why is it five times what I thought it was supposed to be? And then they go and they find a Bitcoin mining operation in like a region that they never touch. And they're like, oh man, you know, how did that happen? And then they go and they delete it. Those people were really lucky, right? That's the best case scenario that somebody sets up a Bitcoin mining operation in your environment. You're like, awesome. That is awesome. Nobody destroyed anything. Nobody stole my data. Nobody, hopefully, you wouldn't even know probably, right? So those people have been pretty damn lucky. Don't use your, ID, uh, you know, your bill as your IDS system. Um, if you are using your bills, at least turn on billing alerts. <laughs> um, but turn on CloudTrail. And you have to turn on CloudTrail for each region. So you can't just turn it on in one region. You have to turn it on in all regions. And you have to be um, pushing all the information. Create multiple AWS accounts. Set up one account where you're going to push all your CloudTrail data. And then point some sort of system that can make heads or tails of all that data, because it's going to be a lot of information. And you're not going to be able to consume it just by looking at the logs. It's, just a ton of blobs of, of JSON, compressed JSON data. But go and use something like Logstash. If you haven't played with Logstash, it's, um, they even call it the Elk stack now, Elasticsearch, uh, Logstash, and, and Kibana. Really nice solution. They have a, uh, um, a plugin for uh, CloudTrail. It'll pull all that information in, and it looks really, really nice. Um, you might find that the small system that you created initially to manage all your, or just to watch all your CloudTrail data is not going to cut it because it is an enormous amount of information. Imagine every single API call that happens anywhere in AWS in your account flowing into this system. Um, and then there's commercial solutions starting to, to, to show up. I think Splunk is pulling in CloudTrail, uh, CloudTrail data now, and, um, and so is um, a couple others. But uh, um, turn that on. If you're not looking at those logs, you're basically not watching the biggest door into your data center, which is the APIs. So let me pause there for a second, because I'm going to talk a little bit about what, um, what, what I built at, at Vericode to kind of keep tabs on some of these things and what, what we'll be kind of sharing with some folks. Any questions so far? Anything that you want me to dive a little deeper in? Are you still with me? Everybody with me? That's good. A lot of nodding heads. All right. Awesome. I haven't fallen asleep. I'm not died and gone to heaven or anything. All right. Good. Um, all right, so uh, Verco started a project a little while ago called Cloud Atlas. And uh, the idea was to look behind the clouds, right? To figure out what's going on behind the scenes because we started very early building systems in AWS that grew to, you know, by our standards, at least by our, our, our world, very large. We had thousands of systems running and uh, lots of things coming up, going down, lots of teams working. We didn't want to slow people down, um, but we needed to keep tabs on what was going on. So we started digging into that. So Cloud Atlas's goal is to analyze basically the full stack of that application. Remember I was talking about all the environment in red, right? Not just the application. So Vericode, traditionally, we've been focused on that application. You can take your Java app. You can take your you know, PHP app, upload that to us. We'll analyze it and tell you what's wrong with it. But what about the rest of the system, right? In particular, if I'm deploying that in AWS. So this system requires only read-only API access. Um, we're going to um, have a piece of it free for, as, a, as a SaaS service. Um, there's absolutely nothing at that URL right now other than a coming soon um, because we're just not quite ready yet. Um, I apologize for that. But I want to talk about what it, what it does. Um, I have a nice command line interface that works for me, but I want to make it a little bit more accessible. So things it does. Um, so first, obviously, it's going to enumerate all your services. Um, that's, um, you know, you can get a lot of that data already. You can go into the web UI. You can do an EC2 describe instances. But what we go um, past that is to enumerate all the services and pull in data from how all those services interrelate with each other, right? And we start building that map. Um, and then at that point, um, once we've built that initial map, we then start monitoring CloudTrail to detect the moment something new happens, right? 
So we're trying to track changes in near real time. That's about five to 15 minutes or so, because CloudTrail is only updating every five minutes, and then there's kind of a lag. Um, so we try to map all that out and then perform analysis on all the services that are in use and how those things. The goal, it's pretty lofty, I don't know if we'll ever achieve it, is to try to understand that emergent insecurity or those patterns that occur in all, all the systems. Um, so in a very rough data, when I look at the data, you know, I see uh, stuff like this, which makes tons of sense. But these are like you know, systems that are coming in. When something changes, I see what the change is, very specifically you know, instance going from running to stopped, when it happened, all this stuff. And the neat thing is we can, can reconstruct this information based on CloudTrail data. So if you needed to go back in time and be like, what happened uh, a month ago? Because the data has long been lost from, from the you know, console. I can go and I can recreate that, that change uh, uh, chain. Um, and then the advanced cap capabilities we're working on are what I call image cracking, which is basically to break open the AMI or the EBS volumes and enumerate what's in there. And our goal there is, is you know, to find the applications and then you know, potentially we, we could do other analysis on that. Um, but the most uh, you know, complicated piece right now that, uh, that I, I'm, I'm trying to wrap up, which is around permission analysis of IAM uh, credentials and roles and profiles and everything. Um, I want to be able to tell who can do what, where, why, when, how, everything, all connected, all the details that are related to that, so that when you run this against your, your environment, it comes back and says, you know, your entire dev team can basically do whatever the heck they want, right? And maybe you want to change that. Question? So the policy simulator will give you that information, right? What we're trying to do is, is give you that information um, across not just one account. And, and, I mean, granted, there are tools already out there that you can fire up you know, Python and bang out a bunch of code. You could probably get pieces of that. What we're trying to do is make this very automated so it just happens, right? So that I can set, set up policies of my own and say, all right, I want to make sure that these permissions require these things. And when things drift out of policy, I automatically know. Policy simulator is going to tell me what I can and can't do but it's going to be for a specific account, and maybe I've got hundreds of accounts or hundreds of API keys. Um, I want to be able to do things like, you have this API key, it's been hanging out there for a, a year, and nobody's ever used it. Well, maybe we should turn that off. Like, it's hard to know when you to, to turn some of that stuff off. Um, and then there's lots of other tools out there, obviously. We're not the only ones trying to do stuff. Amazon's got their own solution. It's uh, a trusted advisor. They've got you know, a certain level of capability if you've got a, diff, you know, a um, business support package or whatever. It's great. You should be looking at it. It's great information. Um, Nets, uh, you know, Netflix team, you'd be remiss to not mention some of the stuff they're working on. I mean, Security Monkey recently came out and set that up. It'll help enumerate all, all the services that are out there and do some of the things. There's a little bit of overlap there, but they've got a whole ton of stuff. There was a talk yesterday on uh, Project uh, Monterey that uh, um, is you know, trying to, to provide a scanning framework for analyzing things. Um, and then Nimbo Stratus is Andreas's. Um, a toolkit that he created. It's uh, you know basically focused on that specific use case of uh, of exploiting uh, metadata uh, in uh, uh, in his in his talk from Black. And if you I think you can get the slides online, you should check it out. It's good stuff. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. I wanted to thank you all. May all your clouds come with a luck dragon. If you don't know what a luck dragon is, go look that up immediately and watch that movie because it'll change your life. But any questions? One question back there. Yeah. So read-only read permissions to, to everything. Um, and if you give us, I, I'm trying to figure out how I can make it at least privilege. Um, but uh, uh, right now, I've, I've my set the bar at read-only to everything. <laughs> Um, if you, oh, I'm trying to set it up so that if you give me more permissions than I need, it'll actually tell you to, to stop. Don't do that. That's your, I don't want you to trust me with that information, right? Um, but it's read-only permissions. Any other questions? Is everybody excited to go use the cloud? You know, think about it as an operating system now. Have anybody ever thought about it that way before? No? That's pretty cool. All right, question? Um, yeah, I will, uh, you know what, um, uh, send me a, a note on Twitter or something like that, and I will, I, I have a, a thing on the GitHub slide share thing, whatever it is. I'll put it up there probably, uh, make sure that you guys can get But feel free to send me a note. Um, we, s we create a little uh, a Twitter handle on the Cloud Atlas page so that when that is ready, we can send everybody a message and let people know about that. Um, and
you know, it's, this is a, you know, an adventure for us, um, getting this stuff out into people's hands and, and kind of getting people to think about an application that I think is much different than uh, what we traditionally think about when we're, when we're thinking in AppSec where we're focused on a Java code or the individual components that we've written and, and try to take a bigger uh, uh, step back and think about the entire infrastructure and how we're going to analyze that code and that system in itself. So thank you guys. You've been great. Really appreciate it.